Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Amanda Poss. I am the Gallery Director for Hillsborough Community College. Thank you all for joining us to celebrate the opening of our newest exhibition at Gallery 221 at HCC Dale Mabry campus titled Engulfed. I had the distinct pleasure of co-curating this exhibition with Sarah Howard, Curator of Public Art and Social Practice at the University of South Florida, who will also be speaking tonight as part of our panel discussion. Engulfed includes selections from the permanent art collection of the USF Contemporary Art Museum by artists Lisette Castillo and Mark Dion, alongside regional voices including Brandy Ziegel, Kenny Jensen, Carol Mickett, Robert Stackhouse, Laurencia Strauss, and Tori Tapp. With approaches using critical examination, humor, honor, and participatory engagement, these artists speak to the interconnected issues between species and the earth, and how its air, water, and soil qualities and conditions impact the resources we need to survive. The exhibition is on view at the Dale Mabry campus now through May 6th. You can view the exhibition by making an appointment on our website, hccfl.edu slash gallery 221. We hope you also save the date for two future events associated with this exhibition. Artist Laurencia Strauss will lead a skills workshop on compost with a robust discussion about environmental issues on Wednesday, March 31st, beginning at 6 p.m. And then a closing reception, this time moderated by Sarah Howard, will be held on Thursday, April 29th at 6 p.m. in conversation with Laurencia Strauss and Tori Tepp. Now I'd like to mention a few things about our Zoom meeting before we get started with tonight's event. As you may have noticed, we are recording this meeting in Zoom. Simply subscribe to our YouTube channel at Gallery221HCC if you would like to be notified when this is available. And for the best experience of our event tonight, we recommend using the view icon in your top right and select speaker view. For clarity, everyone except speakers will be muted. However, we do welcome your participation just in the form of the chat section. This is where we'll look for your questions in the Q&A at the end of tonight's event, and we'll get to those in the order in which they appear. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dustin Lemke, Dean of Associate of Math and Sciences at the HCC Dale Mabry campus, for a few words of welcome on behalf of the college. Dustin, at this time, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and unmute. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> uh, welcome to Hillsborough Community College. We appreciate you uh, joining us for this. Uh, really thrilling. Um, I really appreciate um, each of the artists who have allowed their work to be shared with us. I've, I've been to this twice already just to sort of take it in and enjoy it. Well, I went twice today, so three times, I guess. <laughs> um, I, really stunning. Um, I, love the, I love that some of the pieces are huge and sort of overwhelming. And then many of the pieces are very small, um, like little collections that have been uh, gathered for us. Um, very inspirational, um, really reminded me of everything that we do with nature. Um, I mean, I made a tiny little list just from the one thing. We draw nature, we classify nature, um, we use it to entertain ourselves, we move it, we craft it how we want it to be, we eat it, um, we can make music out of it, um, we even use it for tourism. This was just all in this one exhibit that all these pieces remind us of all these things to do um, and, and many other things that we can do with it. And then one small print in the Kenny Jensen um, in one of the Kenny Jensen pieces reminded me that it's not only all of those things, but we are nature. There's one small picture that just um, that reminded me that it's, it's not just something that I can do to nature or that nature does to me, but I'm part of it and we're, we can't escape this, it, it is us. So, um, Special shout out to Sarah and Amanda on this. I, you know, my training and my background is not in art. And I'm always amazed at what the curators bring to the table on this. And they're able to look at a wide group of people, choose pieces of their art, bring it together, and put it together in such a stunning way that um, it, 
I mean, certainly the artists are to be commended, but the way the curators can see this and bring something together, I think Amanda and Sarah really did something amazing with this. Um, and then I will insult them at the same time. I hate the title of it, Engulf. Um, I, clearly they did that to irritate us all um, because the word engulf, I can't think of very often that engulf means something good. Um, and so they've gotten our attention. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago when Rick Scott was the governor and something like 25 college professors who were science um, professors got together to go to his office to convince him that climate change was real. Do you guys remember when that happened? And I honestly thought at the time, I was like, I don't get it. Like if they've been telling people for 25 years that it's real, why do they think one visit to his office is going to change anything? I don't recall that it changed anything. <laughs> I think it might not be the scientists that, that help us the most with this. And it might not be journalists who help us the most with this. I think it might be artists who help us the most with this, that, that help us to see and appreciate the nature that's around us and remind us um, that in many ways we live by a gulf, but we're engulfed. And so I, I'm teasing, I don't really hate the title, but I do. But um, so well done, so well curated, such amazing pieces, very inspirational. So I'm very excited to hear um, from the artists tonight and hear more about the inspiration. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you artists for uh, moving our souls and helping us to uh, look once again at the world around us with new eyes. So thank you. Thank you, Dustin, for such generous praise and, and strong uh, provocation, I guess, on the part of, of Sarah and I for the title of the show. But um, clearly, it's working getting, getting you thinking, and I hope it does the same for members of our audience tonight. Uh, I have a few words of thanks before I introduce our esteemed panelists. We are deeply grateful for the support of the HCC Del Mabry Campus Student Government Association, whose generous funding makes our exhibitions and programs possible throughout the year. This exhibition was also made possible with support from the University of South Florida's Institute for Research and Art, Contemporary Art Museum and Graphic Studio, who shared with us works from the permanent art collection of the university. With that in mind, I wanted to especially recognize Shannon Annis, USF's curator of the collection and exhibitions manager for her assistance in coordinating the loan, as well as my co-curator, Sarah Howard, whose invaluable contributions and insights helped to shape this exhibition from concept to reality. Thank you, Sarah, for being so generous with your time and expertise. I want to express my personal thanks to the contributions of the HCC gallery team, Emiliano Sedacasi and Michael Murphy, who are both working behind the scenes tonight, as well as our student worker, Devon Gibbon, they each deserve special recognitions for all their efforts and the numerous steps involved from realizing an exhibition, especially one of this scope. We are also fortunate to have the support of Amy Mousquet, Interim Dean for Associate of Arts, Dustin Lemke, who you just heard from, and Dr. Alan Witt, the HCC Dale Mabry Campus President. Finally, my heartfelt gratitude goes to all our exhibiting artists, especially those with us tonight, Carol Mickett, Robert Stackhouse, Brandy Ziegel, and Kenny Jensen. Thank you for lending us your time and talents. It's an honor to host your work at Gallery 221 at HCC. Now, as we move on to our panel discussion, I'm going to begin by introducing each artist who will then say a few words about themselves and their practice. And I'll begin by introducing to you, Sarah Howard. Sarah Howard joined the staff of the University of South Florida Institute for Research and Art, or IRA, in 2000. For the past two decades, Howard has contributed across the IRA platforms of the Contemporary Art Museum, Graphic Studio, and the Public Art Program by researching, producing, and presenting contemporary artist projects. In 2013, Howard was appointed as Curator of Public Art and Social Practice and currently administers Florida's Art and State Buildings Program across three USF campuses. She works with national and local partners, artists, galleries, city agencies, and civic organizations to present exhibitions, community-based projects, and public art installations, all exploring the intersection of art, politics, and social and environmental justice. Howard received her MFA in studio art from the University of South Florida and earned a BFA in painting and printmaking from Virginia Commonwealth University. From 2012 to 2020, Howard served on the board of directors for Tampa Nonprofit Tempest Projects, 
and currently she serves on the board for the Arts Education Nonprofit Community Stepping Stones. She is also a founding member of Tampa Art Collective Crab Devil in her spare time. <laughs> Hello, Sarah. Go ahead. Hi. Great to yeah, see you yourself. all. Thank you so much for this invitation to work with you on this exhibition. It's been a really meaningful collaboration. And I want to thank your entire team at HCC and the HCC community for the beautiful installation and um, documentation and the brochure. It's all just been really fabulous um, to see it come to fruition. I think Amanda and I started talking about this uh, well over a year ago and you know, kind of had to put things off a little bit, but it's, it's delightful to see it come together so beautifully. And to all the artists participating, it's been wonderful working with each of you as well. So I really appreciate the opportunity. And I'm just, you know, this is a topic, the environment and ecology is just a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, as I was a native Floridian, I was born here, but I grew up elsewhere and, um, I've been back about two, dec two decades, so or it's, you know, just a, a really special place. And I think that, um, as Dustin said in his wonderful opening remarks, you know, this is a, a way to reach people um, to express how important and critical this issue is to us moving forward. Hey, thank you so much, Sarah. I'd now like to introduce Carol Mickett and Robert Stackhouse. Uh, Carol Mickett and Robert Stackhouse of Mickett Stackhouse Studio have been making art collaboratively and individually for over 60 years. They make two-dimensional and three-dimensional place-appropriate art that is collected and commissioned by museums, private collections and collectors, commercial developers, and state and local governments. Mickett comes to the collaboration from a background in philosophy, film, radio, poetry, and theater. Stackhouse followed a traditional visual arts path. His visual work is in museum collections around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art, the National Gallery in Washington, DC, and the National Gallery of Australia. Both hold PhDs, Mickett in philosophy, and Stackhouse an honorary doctorate from the University of South Florida in art. They and their work have, been re have received many national honors, including being the 2020 Creative Pinellas Art Laureates, and they've got a, a massive exhibition they are also currently staging there. So um, Carol and Robert, go ahead and unmute and tell us a little bit more about yourselves. So um, we're, we're happy to be part of the show that um, is about a topic that we are um, especially interested in and are focusing our art making on. Um, so, so about a year ago, we had a show at HCC in, in Ybor City. So we're making a habit of being in HCC shows. So this is, uh, let's do one next year. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a show that's opening next Wednesday called Expanding Waters at the Creative Pinellas um, Galleries. It's uh, just us, it's four galleries. It includes a large installation um, many paintings, um, a mate to the one that's in your show. Um, it's called Aspiring Golf Mangrove. Um, and it also includes um, a thought experiment room, which um, invites people to draw and write their solutions to the issues of climate change and sea level rise. And the sorts of practical things that we can do in our lives to mitigate those um, issues. As poet laureates, we like to, uh, uh, in, in, in poet, as artist laureates, excuse me, we, we um, want to include uh, a lot of the other arts in the community. So the, uh, the installation sculpture is designed to be a participant in theater, in this case, Shakespeare, parts of Shakespeare dance. Uh, the sculptor is going to be encouraged to dance with the dancers and uh, um, there will be literary uh, programs and uh, scientific panels, mm -hmm. uh, four of them I believe, that Carol uh, will uh, be the moderator of. And 
And also a conversation with Jodica Vermani, who's the, it's our dog, um, uh, who's the um, executive director of the Schmidt um, Ocean Institute in California. And another talk with all the Dimmit women who are environmental activists. One thing that Amanda said in introducing us is that we've been collaborating for 60 years. Um, no. <laughs> I don't think that that's possible. Um, I think it's more like um, 20 some years. <laughs> so, um, and we're, we're delighted to be working together but and to be in the show. One of us did start making art almost 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder who that was. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you for correcting that a little bit. Um, and I think we had plenty of, of animals making a uh, sound of <laughs> Zoom calls, <laughs> but I love hearing about the interdisciplinary aspect of your show at Creative Pinellas. And so if you guys can't get enough of Carol and Robert's work in our show, there's lots more to see just across the bay. Uh, at this time, I'd now like to introduce Brandy Ziegel. Brandy Ziegel is a visual artist and printmaker. Prior to receiving her BA in art education from the University of Maine in 2016, she was active duty in the military. She is a 2018 Creative Pinellas Emerging Artist grantee and 2020 Gasparilla Art Festival Emerging Artist. Ziegel has had work exhibited in a variety of juried group exhibitions and her relief prints have been featured in several publications. She approaches printmaking as a medium that has potential to be used as a powerful mnemonic device that raises awareness about our threatened national heritage. Brandy, go ahead and unmute. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, thank you, Amanda. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you to you and Sarah um, for including me in the show. I think it's incredibly important, especially now in times like this. Um, I think this topic is uh, I hope it's at the top of everyone's minds these days. I know it's something that I'm always thinking about and has consumed my work and my practice for the past five years, especially. So um, I did uh, become a printmaker when I was in my undergrad program at University of Maine. Um, part of my gravitation to it is um, kind of the universal aspect of it. It's very egalitarian. So I really like that, that part of it, you know, being a multiple and that means it being shared more. So, um, and it can expand outside the gallery space. So that in of itself, you know, draws attention to more people, larger art audience. So I think that's a perfect um, way to bridge the environmental topic into it. Um, so that's kind of my focus um, in terms of my practice. It's rooted in traditional methods, but um, as time goes on, I'm getting a little more experimental. And um, you can see that in the pieces I have in the show, I have a traditional woodblock print. Um, and then I also have um, a piece there that includes some uh, artifacts. So paired with printmaking practice. Um, but ultimately I, I consider myself a drawer. I don't know how you, what do you call yourself as someone that likes to draw? <laughs> I've been doing that for as long as I can remember, but um, printmaking is kind of that happy medium where I can include the drawing aspect, but then take it a, a step further. Um, so yeah, again, thank you um, for including me and uh, it looks like a beautiful show. So congratulations to Sarah and Amanda and the HCC team. And to you for including your work. Um... I, I hope that after people see the show and your, your really beautiful prints that the environment is also at the top of their minds if it wasn't before. I'd now like to introduce our final panelist, Kenny Jensen. Kenny Jensen is a multidisciplinary artist living with his wife, Maggie, and young son, Cedar, in St. Petersburg, Florida, and their family land, The Floating Woods, in rural yeah. Hammock, Florida. Jensen has been involved in the Tampa Bay area art community as a professional artist, preparator and art handler, curator and grassroots organizer for the past 20 years. His diverse creative background includes painting, sculpture, photography, site-specific installations, video, graphic design, musical composition and performance art. Just a few. Kenny, go ahead and unmute and tell us more about yourself. Well, yeah, so I, um, as you can see from, I'm here in my studio, as you can see from what's behind me right now, I 
I have a lot of stuff going on. I'm kind of a maximalist as the, you know, as my history shows. But first of all, um, thank you so much, Amanda and Sarah, for including me in this exhibition and providing this opportunity. Uh, it's just been a real joy to work with you all again. Um, I was able to have a solo exhibition in Gallery 3 in 2019, and it's just been really special to come back and work with the whole team again. Um, so thank you to Emiliano and Michael. And it's also just been a real pleasure to, um, to participate in a show like this where the other works and the other artists, I just really feel like kindred spirit with. Um, and also um, inspiration and things I wouldn't have ever thought of uh, relating to uh, working through these issues. So it's been really exciting. Um, and uh, I've had a really fun time in the space and just being around the art. I, um, you see the installation, I spent a little bit of time on it. And I, so I got to be around everything. Um, and yeah, it was really the, the process of making the work was, was, cathar was cathartic. It was, um, it helped me kind of meditate on it. And uh, that was a really special opportunity. So thank you. Yeah, and, and Kenny is being very modest when he says he spent a little bit of time working on the installation, um, as you'll see from photographs later on. It's a very complex layered installation. We're so delighted to have it at Hillsborough Community College. So now I want to engage in uh, some deeper questions about the show. As you all have been hearing, Engulf presents a selection of artists' work that engage pressing ecological concerns, the climate crisis, and sustainability of the planet and its resources. Um, when we first started working together in the show, Sarah and I began by identifying certain artworks from the USF collection to serve as points of investigation that would then be expanded upon by Florida-based artists. Sarah, can you introduce our audience to the artworks we selected by Lisette Castillo and Mark Dion, both of which are represented in USF's collection? I'd be delighted to, thank you. So um, the two works that we, or two series of works that we chose for the engulfed exhibition, both are, were printed at Graphic Studio. And if you're not familiar with Graphic Studio, it was established in 1968 and it's one of the leading university ateliers or workshops. It's part of the USF Institute for Research and Art, which includes the Contemporary Art Museum and the Public Art Program and is within the College of the Arts at USF. And so what Graphic Studio does is it invites international contemporary artists to work in residence to produce print and sculpture editions in collaboration with the master printers and sculpture fabricators. And Robert Stackhouse has been one of our illustrious um, artist who has been in residence at the studio. But as a nonprofit and educational workshop, artists are free to experiment with materials and processes to expand their practice in new directions. And works produced and published at Graphic Studio are archived in the USF collection and also offered to the National Gallery of Art, which has maintained an archive of Graphic Studio works since 1991. So um, the first series of works I'm going to introduce is by Lisette Castillo. She was born in 1974 in Camagüey, Cuba, and studied at the Institute for Superior de Art in Havana, graduating in 1998 with a master's in fine arts. And she's the recipient of residencies, fellowships, and exhibitions from major institutions and has shown extensively in Europe and the US. She currently lives and works in Amsterdam. And I think it's important to note that uh, Castillo grew up during the special period in Cuba. And this was a time when Cubans began experiencing exceptional hardship and shortages and rationing of basic resources, food, medicine, fuel for energy and transportation as subsidies from the Soviet Union were eliminated following its collapse in 1991. So this lack of social infrastructure and access to basic resources have also been compounded by the US trade embargo. So Castillo's photographic works involve her constructing complex models out of sand, powder pigments, as well as more structural materials like plexiglass, which she then photographs and enlarges to a larger than life scale. And so her use of impermanent materials like sand conveys the shifting nature of things, the tensions between chaos and order, creation and destruction. And the, the grandiose scale shift of the objects in her photographs both highlights the purpose of the objects she depicts, but also reveres their necessity. So the works included in Engulf, Rife, Spoon and Garlic are photogravures that, we, that Graphic Studio published. And these images of 
what we may consider everyday items are elevated through her lens. They're placed on this wood plank and rendered in stark yet rich black and white tones and are given almost a sacred importance and serve as a reminder that the most basic resources for survival and sustenance are often scarce in her native Cuba. They also prompt a questioning about our own access and awareness of resources, especially during this period of extreme and tumultuous change. And so now we'll look at Mark Diane's work, uh, a The World in a Box. Uh, Mark Diane was born in New Bedford New Bedford, Massachusetts in 1961. He's an interdisciplinary artist whose practice examines the ways in which dominant ideologies and public institutions shape our understanding of history, knowledge, and the natural world. His large-scale installations and 2D works appropriate scientific, archaeological, and fieldwork methodologies of collecting, ordering, and exhibiting objects to question how knowledge is constructed and disseminated into public discourse. He's known for his fantastical curiosity cabinets modeled on 16th and 17th century exotic collections or vendor common. Diane's practice often blurs the line between art and natural history museum displays. So uh, the world in the box featured and engulfed is a suite of 27 prints executed in a range of printmaking techniques, including lithography, etching, digital printing, cyanotype, woodcut, letterpress, screen print, and direct reviewer. The work com comes housed in a wooden box and con it contains a series of charts, graphs, diagrams, and lists that examine the distinctions between the objective and rational scientific methods and subjective or irrational influences on our ways of knowing. In many of the prints, Diane uses his signature red and blue markings or drawings that reference the dual colored pencils that were often used in labs and educational settings for correcting or proofing work. And many of the images challenge our perceptions and beliefs by charting fictitious ideologies of evolution and life cycle ecologies and depict confounding social and cultural histories to capture our imaginations and expand our understanding about how the construction of knowledge around nature impacts environmental politics and public policy. Thank you for that thorough introduction for both of the artists. Um, I like that you touched on the ideas of awareness and challenging perspectives, all of which are so important for environmental issues and considering the broad ranging impacts that our actions have on the environment and the way that impacts us in return. Um, I like that we ended with Mark Dion because I feel sometimes a similar impulse in the work of Kenny. Uh, so Kenny, the act of collecting underscored by a fundamental curiosity regarding the natural world really permeates your work quite strongly. Your installation in the gallery features materials such as complex root systems and milled cedar wood all gathered from your family's land in Gulf Hammock. Can you describe the work as it appears in the show, especially with respect to how you found materials or how you use these found materials to investigate the complexity of the world and our place within it? Yeah, um, that's phrased very well. Um, yeah, so the experience of, um, of the work I can kind of walk through that a little bit and then talk about um, where the materials came from and, and what I was thinking as, as I um, arranged it and installed it. Um, so yeah, the experience when you first come into the gallery, uh, the gallery's laid out, has these kind of, they call them the teeth in front of the, in front of the window wall. And uh, so when you're first walking into the space, um, there's just kind of ambiguous, seemingly organic forms just kind of floating where they're, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect something to be. Um, and so it kind of draws you around and the, the installation itself um, is about 20 feet long. And when viewed from one end, um, it presents a certain perspective. And the other end, it's, it's a very different, uh, from one end, there is kind of like this uh, clarity, this, it kind of clicks into place and the other end it's it just seems apparent just fully chaotic um so when you so along with these natural materials uh that are presented um there are also 16 framed four by six 
um, prints from 35 millimeter film that were all shot um, in the early 2000s. So this is kind of post-college. Um, I was doing a lot of photography at the time. My grandmother growing up, um, you know, she just took photographs constantly and especially at her land, at my grandparents' land where they, in Gulf Hammock, Florida, where they built this cabin and there was this pool and this giant barn where my grandfather built a giant boat my whole childhood. Uh, and so I was always exposed to this way of like noticing and then capturing and then sharing. And, and this format to me has always been very crucial to my own formation and development, um, both as, as an artist, but also just understanding my place in the world around me and like what has formed me, um, how, I'm, how I perceive the world around me. Um, and so each one of these, uh, so there's 16 total, there are eight groupings. So each one of these has a partner and, um, and they, all, they all are kind of built like little curiosity uh, cabinets. And all of the wood is from cedar that was, that was needed to be cut down on the land, cedar trees that was milled. And then I, I then made the frames out of those. And so they all, they're, they're, the whole series is called Seeds. They all have individual names, the groupings. But they're like the seeds of when I kind of initially started waking up to my broader place in the earth, in, in the environment. Um, they're like seeds that kind of subconsciously were planted and they've developed as I've become um, a practicing you know, artist um, and being more intentional about how I move through the world, especially this land. And so some of those images actually capture probably some of the actual trees that are in the installation when you look to your um, when you look to your right um, standing in front of those images and so those those root systems um, consist of trees um, but they also from from the swamp and uh, trees that died uh, so there's a, the, some of the largest ones are are the heart of cedar which doesn't really decay as fast um, so they have these like all of them have these unique unique forms that are kind of ambiguous in shape. They almost look like little creatures. And so that's something that draws me to them as well as their uniqueness, the forms themselves. But then when seen from that, when seen from that perspective, looking down, they all um, work together to form, um, it's like a tunnel you're looking through, which, which allows you to see this void. And that, that void is in the shape of my, act, my own silhouette kind of the average human size. Um, so it's this idea that, um, as the Dean was saying, like very much the thing that resonated as I was making this is like, we are nature, but we have removed ourselves from it at the expense of, of the broader environment, but also at the expense of our own uh, ability to be whole. Uh, so removing ourselves from um, this greater organism that is the earth, we are a part of that. Um, and so I was just really working through how to investigate that, how to consider that even in my own life. Um, so that's, that was very much a part of my thinking. And then at the end, um, if you go around to the other side of that, of that tunnel of roots, um, you can see the outline uh, of the form consists of very small little, uh, they're all grass roots, like from your lawn, like a dead lawn uh, that have been painted. And so it's like the, the smallest life kind of coming back into this. Um, that's, you know, maybe there's this hope to, um, to inform um, where, to, where to move, how to reconnect. Um, and we're going to talk more about that. But so the, the piece itself is called the understory. And so it's investigating this idea, whereas in the swamp, in the forest, um, there's been a lot of research in recent decades that shows that in the understory, what's happening beneath the surface where all the trees are, there's a communication, there's, there's a wood wide web, as they say. Um, I didn't make that up. Um, so that kind of connects all these trees together and they actually communicate. And, and when one of them falls, it actually is to the detriment of all of the other trees around it. Um, so it's just that idea of when we're removing ourselves out of that, um, you know, like we're, we're experiencing um, both for the broader environment, but as a society and indiv individuals, 
we're experiencing firsthand now in a very real vivid way um, what that results in. Um, I love that you mentioned the world, the wood wide web um, and how you're really inviting us to be a part of it or to see our place that's always been a part of it. Um, there's so much about presence and absence with that void that you have um, made in the, the shape of the human body that invites us to think about where we fit in it and, and really to reconnect ourselves with it. I think that's quite compelling and lovely. Um, I now like to direct my next question to Carol and Robert. Um, many of your recent works have taken up the issue of climate change, presenting both real and imagined solutions to pressing environmental issues. And in your brand new painting, as you mentioned, uh, Aspiring Gulf Live Oak, viewers are presented with this incredible mature live oak tree that's twined together with coastal current or coastal outlines and the currents of the Gulf of Mexico and the scale, the colors and the subjects create both a sense of very clear honor, but also an underlying sense of tension. So why is the issue of climate change such an important focus in your work? In what role do you see plants like the live oak playing in affecting positive change? So um, trees, we've been working with water um, for a long time. You can see in the back, um, this was one of our first collaborations, the tarpon and the serpent in, in water. And we've been exploring water uh, and ways of depicting water for a long time. And in following um, things about water, we, started to look at issues of um, bodies of water. Hence, we became very involved in maps and mapping and trying to map a body of water and what the identity of a body of water actually is. Um, we also have used water throughout the world as a way of a metaphor for how connected we are. Because we know with water, for example, we know with hurricanes that hurricanes that happen here start in Africa and they're all connected throughout the world. And um, we see that as a metaphor for how we are all connected um, through all of the networks in our community um, and throughout the world. And then we started making uh, paintings about the moon because the moon influences the waters and you'll see in the show in um in creative pinellas that the installation which is called breath of influence um has a large moon painting that influences the waters and um and from that we became very interested in what's happening with water namely it's getting very hot and you'll see paintings that where the waters are on fire and um, the creatures in the water are on fire. And then we said, okay, well, what can we do about it? And of course, we aren't, you know, major scientists. So we said, well, wh what do you do when you want warmer, cooler water? Well, you put ice in it. So we use the ice cube tray um, as a sort of symbol of mitigation. And then to think through what it would mean to put ice in the waters. How would you do it? Well, if you used a refrigerator, you're using fossil fuels. If you're not using solar, so you just put more heat, so you can't do that. So you have to start thinking about, well, how would you take it out? If you put it on barges, again, you're using fossil fuels. How would it affect the ecosystem? So it's a way of going, Meh. but that's what's important is that we all need to start thinking about what are the consequences of our actions and how does that affect um, the environment? Well, one of the good things to do is to have trees because trees absorb the CO2, which is the thing that traps the heat in our environment and we have way too much CO2, which of course 
the primary thing that causes it is fossil fuels. So in this painting, you see the live oak, which absorbs lots of CO2, it creates shade. It's called aspiring golf because the golf likes this. Um, and it would be healthy if there are lots of um, oaks and mangroves and less oil refineries and automobiles that use gas, but also trees, their leaves go together and they purify our air. They help clean our air. Trees do so much for us. And Kenny remarked about how they're all connected. Again, this is the metaphor for the waters are all connected by currents, the trees are connected by their roots, and we're all connected. We think we're individuals, you know, and we are just like individual trees, but we have a root system in a sense, our current system that connects all of us. And that is something that we all sort of want to embrace. Um, so. So, um, you know, from, from uh, uh, a making art point of view on this thing, uh, we uh, had a large uh, studio in, in St. Pete downtown and we rented part of our space mm -hmm. to uh, uh, the US Geological, uh, US Geological sure. Survey. And uh, they used some of our space just as their storeroom and had the most amazing bunch of junk in it you'd ever imagine because they didn't have all the money in the world. So they had to make their own stuff. They had a volcano that erupted and all sorts of things made out of the paper mache, the, made out of paper mache and the, uh, the, the foam filler you put in cracks in your house and stuff. And uh, so we got to know them, some of those people pretty well. You know, and uh, so we, we had some association with them. We were able to use some of their information. They were offering it to us. And one day we were over at uh, USGS and we were asking them, we were, we were wanting to do some studies about the layering of the, of the ocean from top to bottom. And uh, we said, is there anybody over there that has any pictures of the layering of the ocean from the top of the ocean to the, to the sea floor. And they said, yes, there is somebody there that's been doing nothing but that. So we went over and we met the guy and he's he, he, very friendly and he's excited that we're all excited about this. And he pulls out this, this graph and what he, what he has done is he has studied a one inch cylinder from top to bottom of the ocean. So, I mean, he has all the data of what, what the different levels of the water are, what the different salinity and, and temperatures, everything about it uh, from top to bottom, uh, but it's in a one inch cylinder. And, and that's the difference. I think as, as visual artists, we can say, well, maybe we're, we're going to expand that a little bit in, in <laughs> our ability yeah. as visual artists to, to expand the concept of the ocean having so many different layers like, like, uh, like solid geography in a way. So I think, you know, our getting from ways of depicting water is that we're curious about water. It's, it's a fascinating subject to try mm -hmm. to make art about, especially three-dimensional art. You know, so it's it, uh, it it it's a real challenge for us, and it it's gotten us here, where we are now. It's gotten us to climate change, and we've started getting to seawater rising. Um, Carol did some drawings of of that uh, back in two thousand and eight, and where she was looking at ways of warming the water and cool. so cool, cooling the water. So. Um, it's not, it's not that we've just come into this, it's just that it's, it's working towards evolving. this. Yeah. yeah, it's evolving towards this. And I think one of the reasons we're so interesting in maps and in this painting, a map of the Gulf of Mexico is that um, we know things are local, but they're also global. And the map shows um, a place, a big place in which, 
living in the west coast of Florida were part of. And what happens over on the um, west part of the Gulf or the south part of the Gulf or the north part affects us. And I think um, we have to remember that, um, at least I have to remember that even though I'm in my little world, I'm also part of this bigger world. Well, reading this painting, it's a, it's a, it's a picture story in a way. The Gulf of Mexico is in a box and it's, uh, it's contained, it's local. Uh, but you see the Gulf Stream coming from off canvas to going to, through, the, through the Gulf and then off canvas again. And that's your global connection. So it's, it, we're using the structure of the canvas in order to, to accentuate the uh, sense of local and of global. And the trees going beyond the box as well because the trees have a, a far reach. And it's something we can do. As I say, plant a tree, save a mullet, save a sperm whale, save us. Like that call to action at the end, but I, I really enjoy the way your work, as you were talking about, moves from local to global, connects art and science, humans and nature. Lost you. Yeah. Yeah, we lost <laughs> Um, I'm just saying, I love the way that your work really moves and inspires us. You take these vast amounts of data, you know, these issues can seem so big and overwhelming and abstract for us. Um, but then you present in a way that uh, articulates something that we can reflect on and, and also not just think about, but also perhaps act and do something about it. Um, and now Brandy, uh, your work in the show, Sarah and I selected both your series 11 and counting and the large scale print Swamp Totem. There are elements present that draw from personal and empirical narratives that on one hand, create a sense of marvel and wonder, very much like we were talking about with Carolyn Robert. And on the other hand, also call into question the long-term impact of our actions on nature. Can you expand on this, um, regarding how and why you're using these artworks to create a form of social commentary about nature. Yes, so um, I guess I, I'd like to start with just talking a little bit about my background. Um, a lot of my art um, is rooted in memory. It's kind of the theme I work with. Um, so 11 and counting kind of harkens to that. Um, and, and a lot of that is also um, research base. So with this series, it all highlights um, each each little vignette is um, is a species that's only endemic to Florida. So I mean, it's only found in Florida um, and they're either threatened or endangered um, or imperiled. And when I was researching what species, endemic species specifically to Florida are imperiled and, and, and almost endangered, um, I noticed that there was a uh, stark connection and that was all these animals like no more than three of them grow larger than 18 inches so they're all very tiny um and a lot of them i hadn't even heard of myself so part of um my motivation for only highlighting the endemic was because for me personally i think it's really important to illuminate um the forgotten and marginal parts of our natural world so i think um Part of what we're battling as ecologists or people that just love the environment and artists um, that have the calling to our natural world is that we're battling a, a certain um, mentality about the wild. And it's a very archaic mentality. It's, it's, it's wild and it's scary and it's something that we need to control. Um, and I think in that process, um, and it's been a very short span of time, at least in, in this continent, that we've that we've tried to control nature, we're losing diversity at an incredible rate. And a lot of these um, species that we're losing, they're gone before we even notice they're gone. So in this series, it was important for me to, to draw awareness to that, that we have species here just in the state that are gonna disappear um, if, we don't, if we don't try and protect them. And a lot of them are on private property. They're only found in like one small pond and um, and it's also calls into question what 
of how many of these species are actually endangered because you have different global codes in terms of how do you categorize what species is endangered or imperiled. And biologists argue about this, uh, the Wildlife Commission argues about this, and the national criteria argues this. So even the 11 number is, is questionable. So that's a little daunting that it's, it could be more than that. It probably is because I created this series in 2018. So three years later, yeah, that number has probably grown. Um, so, and part of my, you know, aesthetic choices for uh, how I laid these out is I wanted to uh, express the tension that this, this inherently has. So I, I did push the species in my drawings, their uh, dry point drawings, to the edges because I wanted to de depict that they're not gone yet, but they're almost gone. So, um, and, and the point of putting them in these antique frames was to address that memory aspect is that they're going to inevitably turn into like one of those old black and white, you know, portraits of some, someone that died 80 years ago. We don't know their name, but their portrait is floating in an antique store. Um, and I've always been drawn to those. That's um, some, one of my own interests as a collector. Um, and then with the swamp totem, that comes more from a whimsical point of view. And that's something I've always teetered on. I, I teeter on like the serious like reality and like kind of the dark part of it. And then the, there's like the whimsy, like beautiful part of it. And so with the swamp totem, my purpose for this was not only to you know pay homage to the symbolism of a totem and and how significant those are in honoring our you know our our relatives or natural relatives I, I do consider animals our relatives um and I always have since I was very young um but I also wanted again to kind of subvertly or overtly kind of get address the point of that the land in which these animals inhabit it's shrinking due to urban development um, overdevelopment. Um, we're exploiting resources just in Florida. I think there's like a thousand people that move to the state every day. So that means more condos, more construction, um, more wildlife degradation. So I wanted to kind of literally stack them as a ways to stylistically show that their roaming habitat, their, where they live, their habitat in general is shrinking. So they're literally on top of each other. Um, but Saying that too, with, with the whimsical part, um, I mostly grew up in Florida. My childhood is based in Florida. And there was a part of my childhood where I lived in the Keys and I was always outside snorkeling and hiking with my family, very rooted in nature. Um, and then not long after that, we moved um, to a gated community with some relatives. And this was like a newly developed community. I, like the houses were arm length apart from each other. So I went from like, you know, climbing mango trees and um, snorkeling to playing in like dirt mounds and construction sites and like, you know, climbing up structures of newly built houses and not a tree over five feet in sight. Um, so I, from a very young age, kind of saw the duality of that, of what it means to live in the state where um, it's, there's this like, this childlike perspective of like, that I had of nature being inherently important. That wasn't a question. Like you need, I needed that. I need the trees. I need the mangroves. To seeing like this more mature colonial perspective of like nature as being like a blank slate something we need to conquer and something we need to exploit. So um, while I mostly grew up in Florida, I moved away when I was in middle school. And then I came back um, four years ago, five years ago in 2016. Um, and that's kind of when I, I was starting to put all this together. Like, what is this, what does this awareness of duality mean? Because a lot of my earlier work is really rooted in addressing trauma. And while that's important, it's like a really dark place to only be doing work about that. <laughs> I think it's really important to like, to have hope. And I think that's why I teeter on the whimsy part of stuff. Like I, I, I wanna do the whimsical. And then I also wanna make informed pieces of art that are a little more, it's a little more obvious what I'm, you know, I'm talking about. Um, we need balance. So um, for me, I, I, I think if, if we lose the whimsy or we, we lose the hope and we lose the curiosity, and I think we need those things to elevate the discussion about how do we 
continue on? And how do we how do we acknowledge what we're doing and how we're exploiting and how do we combat that in a way that's you know healthy for everyone? And that meaning Mother Earth and us as humans and our place in this world. So you very eloquently give us this native Floridian perspective to, to see that that balance or the tension between um, man's intervention on nature and the natural world without our intervention, um, that fear of the wilderness and the unknown, that there's this impulse that's very strong in Western colonial cultures to control. And I like that you said even conquer um, and that over control has a negative impact at many different plant and animal species. Those condos might be nice and cozy for humans, but has this direct impact on the other inhabitants that we share the planet with. Um, and you gave me the perfect segue to my, my final question as we are getting close to seven already. It's been a great conversation. Um, and I wanna remind our viewers, we, do, we will leave some time for Q&A. So I see one question in there already. So now is your chance. We have any burning questions for our panelists tonight. Um, so I want to ask our artists, how do you balance between these two impulses, anxiety and hopeful action? And, and do you hope this prompts in the mind or actions of the viewers? Whoever would like to go first? I, I would like to speak to that. Um, am I on? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the installation is composed of these former plants, former trees, um, they're dead roots. Um, but there's, but there's also this idea that even though I've, you know, some of them are from the, the family land, but others are from, um, various landscape jobs I've done in the past is there's fern roots. There's a lot of the smaller, um, root systems are from weeds that I'm just removing from people's yards. Uh, but they have such interesting qualities and character to the forms and so in this within this installation these um former living forms um have been brought together um in this kind of there is this tension because they're mysteriously just kind of hovering in the air are they falling are they rising up um and and it's in this it's in like the like human space that height um but so there's this potential when seen all together, there's this kind of new forest. There's like this, uh, so I'm seeing it as kind of like a way of like looking toward redemption, even, even though this, these are like dead decayed plants, there's a beauty, there's a character, there's, a, there's an inspiring quality to them as individual forms, but also seen together. Um, so I think, you know, there's this idea of like a second nature or of, of new life that comes out of, so, in the swamp, all of the trees, they, they lose their leaves. And, and then when, when a tree does fall, it eventually decomposes and it becomes the soil that provides the opportunity for new life to come through. And, and at the end of the day, that's really what this, this piece is, is, is digging into or hope, you know, hoping to is this, the understory, like what it is that is that our, what it is that really like informs who we are. Uh, and, and it's our connection that, the problem is the separation. So as many of the artists have been saying, it's um, at, our, at our nature, when we are most whole, we are connected. We are connected with each other. We are connected with nature and we are connected through that to ourselves. So that, that's where the hope is for me. I'll go next. Um, I think I'm gonna just teeter off what Kenny said and just say, um, inspire curiosity. That's kind of, um, that's, that's my motivation and also what I hope um, prompts people to, to, to dig deeper. Um, because I, I didn't mention when I lived in the gated community, I did seek out nature, I continued to, and I found a, a little maypop vine behind the cement wall that divided the community from the interstate. So I always think about that. I think about finding that you know, passion flower and thinking that was so otherworldly and alien like I didn't even know what it was when I was looking at it until like five years later. Um, and I just remember the excitement that I felt. And that's kind of what it feels like to look at artwork in general is finding that connection because you can look at all pieces and you're not going to connect with all of them, but there are certain pieces that really resonate. 
Um, and, I, and I think that's kind of the bridge between art and science is they, they kind of behave similarly. They don't expect anything from you. You know, you, you just, you're the viewer. And I, and I think that's, that's what's important about preserving nature and also supporting the arts is like, they don't expect you to be a consumer. You know, you're not going in there having to buy anything. You can just be there and be a viewer, be an observer and just exist. Thanks, Randy. I saw Carol's hand shoot up too about the same time. Go ahead, Carol. But you're muted still. Okay. One of the things Kenny said is, is really important is this cycle, you know, how things are all connected. And that, um, you know, death is just part of the cycle. Um, even in paradise, things die. And, and in terms of, um, you know, we become compost. And one thing, and then things grow from it. And one thing that's striking though, is that vegetation and small animals that died millions of years ago um, that are embedded under the earth, that's what oil is. Oil is made from vegetables <laughs> and animals and natural gas, the oil's there, then the natural gas, then the coal. And it's really interesting that, um, you know, we're planting trees and thinking about how to save nature. And then it's all of that stuff that creates oil. And it's the way in which we then dig it up and use it and burn it that is, um, that is um, making it really difficult for all of us and is in a major crisis. And, you know, sometimes one might think, well, just leave it alone. You know, these things are in our earth and maybe they need to stay there. Um, and who knows in another million years or so if, if our planet still exists. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to be here. I know that because I'm part of that natural cycle and I hope I become some sort of good compost in a, near a tree or something. I, I think there's a, the aspirational thing is that image right behind us. Um, it's a, it's a, the serpent and it's, it's sort of a Euroboric serpent, but it's coming around. It's, it's, circular, it's circular. It comes around to the same place, but at a different level. Mm -hmm. always at a different level. So that's life right there. I mean, it, it's that, uh, what did somebody call it? The mortal coil or something like that. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, and, and that's what that, that is. I mean, it's a serpent, it's a snake, but yet it's the, it's the, continu it's the continuation of things. And it's the, it's the sense of hope that, that the world, you know, that, that nature moves on in, in, in some way. And it's our responsibility to be good stewards. Um, and I think we forget that because, and I, and in a strange way, I think this pandemic has helped to remind us that we do need to be responsible and um, be good stewards in our world. Um, because one of the things that climate change has done is it's reduced the environment for, for animals and has brought them closer to human beings and specific animals like bats, what, you know, and other animals that are too close then spread viruses, viruses that we would not normally have if we didn't keep deforestation and encroaching. Um, so we have a, a huge, maybe, um, impossible job to do but we do have responsibilities for um, generations that aren't even here yet thank you guys i'm going to read a few of the comments that i've been filtering in while you guys have been responding um one another one of our exhibiting artists tori tep says even our own composition our personality is a melange of or microorganisms we are not alone in our body we who we are as a person is a hive of all the organisms in our body. Um, another comment from Joel Potter says, the unity amongst these artists is really encouraging and the role of curiosity when it comes to creations and stewardship is essential in 
also present in everyone, no matter how repressed it may have gotten through culture. Such good work, everyone. Um, Babs Rangel says, great show, everyone. This is not a question, but a comment. This discussion reminds me of a wonderful work by Mark Dion, also in a show, in Seattle, of a fallen tree in a constructed greenhouse. The tree is dead, but has all this other plant life living on it. So the tree is still being used by other plants. Um, and then we have a, a fairly provocative question here from Joanna Keefe. So I'm going to this back to the rest of our panelists. Um, she says, how far reaching historically is the USA's accountability for climate change? Would you say that again? Yeah how, far, yeah, how far reaching historically is the USA's accountability for climate change? Well, I think that in some ways, um, the USA has been responsible um, in terms of making national parks and, and national forests and uh, sacred lands. Um, and in the past, there's been that, a very good respect for that. I think it was Rose, Teddy Roosevelt who started the national park system. And um, I think that people had gardens. I mean, my grandparents had huge gardens and chickens and my father had huge gardens in, in, our, in suburban New Jersey, um, the garden state. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, in the recent years, I think we've been, there is that thing that, Amanda, you keep telling, that tension where there's a way more awareness and people, you know, recycling um, you, and, and people in power and leadership have a lot of influence. It was Jimmy Carter. One day he did a thing in the White House. I watched when I was what, an undergraduate, I don't remember. And he went around the White House in a sweater and he turned the light switches on and off and and said, you know, you can keep the temperature down and wear a, a sweater and turn the lights off when you extra room and do recycling. That was it. I recycled after that. You, you know, the president of the United States sort of instructed me what to do to help the planet, and I did it. Anyone else want to weigh in? Thank you, Carol. I think maybe. Maybe the way I would um, think about the question is this idea of, I don't know, this, this brings it even to a broader topic, but the idea of like empire. Um, so we, we think of empire as kind of like this thing in the past, but uh, in some ways we're kind of <laughs> the largest empire ever. Um, and so it's about, it's about power, it's about control. Um, but I think from, from a personal standpoint, um, like to, that's the primary goal and, and whatever the cost is, it's secondary to that. Um, I think in a, from a personal standpoint, it's this idea of like my privilege, my entitlement um, and how that it actually does, and as, as I experienced the world growing up um, in America and, and that's acted to kind of separate myself from um, the planet, from other people, other cultures. Um, and so it, I, it always, I always go back to this idea of like, what is America? America is, 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 is that like the forest? It's all these different perspectives relative to different traditions and ideas and that all informs. And so if anything, we're, <laughs> it's, it's this idea that the, the less we see difference, the less we see separation, the more we see how pivotal it is for, for instance, what's, what, what someone does um, in China, um, wh however this pandemic started, uh, literally affects everyone in the world. And, and likewise, the way that we do life in America does have its effects and it's becoming more and more noticeable and less and less, we're less and less able to overlook it or ignore it. Um, I don't know as far as pinning the responsibility, it's, it's that idea of separation and a hierarchy of value that we maybe give ourselves as a culture that 
I think is the thing that I'm really trying to point at and maybe dismantle as much as I can in my own life and uh, in the culture around me. Um, I know we're, we're over time. This conversation has been so good. I want to sneak in one last quick question for Kenny from Akiko Katani. Um, Akiko asks, Kenny, are you imagining that the negative spaces in, in your installation, I'm assuming, will be ghosts of our human selves if we do not wake up to climate change? Ooh. <laughs> uh, Akiko, can you write, can you write the, the statement for me? That sounds really, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's ambiguous. Um, it's also in the actual practicality of being in the physical space. Um, you know, if there's multiple viewers, it's hard with uh, COVID. Um, but you can actually, from one side of it, you can actually see um, when someone steps in to look at that piece that's on the wall with the grass roots. You're meant to get up close to it and you actually fill in that void. And so it's in that relationship, if you have the right perspective, if you're aligned in the right way that considers all the factors and in a more holistic way, you know, the idea, it's a pretty earnest, you know, um, but yeah, so it's, it's this idea of that um, it's, it's for us to determine what, whether that will be a void or we will fill in where, what we have removed from nature. But thank you, Fred. <laughs> yeah, very good um, response, and and thank you all for your your comments and and for our audience for your questions. Um, with that, I am going to call this to a close, uh, and I just want to remind you, everyone, and still hanging out with us in the audience that the show is open and available for you to come and see in person to groups of up to four per appointment until May 6th. To come see it for yourself, simply book an appointment on our website or using the link in our Instagram bio at gallery221hcc. We'd love to see you also at our future virtual events. Remember, Laurencia Strauss, another exhibiting artist, will lead a skills workshop on compost on Wednesday, March 31st at 6 p.m. And a closing session moderated by Sarah Howard will take place on Thursday, April 29th at 6 with Laurencia and Tori Tepp. So I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists. I really enjoyed listening to your insights tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Kenny. Yes. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed this group very much. Me too. So, so good thank to be you with all. you all. All right, we are going to replay a slideshow so you can now, as you're having all these comments roll around in your mind, go back to the exhibition. So with that, take care and be well, everyone. <laughs>